This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and it appears on page 1821 of your pew Bible. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow into, up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Many times in the Bible, the church is called the body of Christ, and analogies are made between the church and the human body, such as Christ being the head of the church, and church members making up the rest of the various body parts. The Apostle Paul is especially fond of this illustration, and he uses it to say several different things. And one of those things is found here in Ephesians 4, in verses 15 and 16, Paul indicates that when every part of the human body is working properly with ligaments supporting each other and so forth, then when it's doing what it was created to do, then that body will grow. Well, in the same way, spiritually, when every part of the body of Christ is functioning properly, doing what it's created to do, then there will be a growing, healthy church characterized by unity. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. A beautiful description of the unity of the church is found in the first six verses of this chapter in, in Ephesians 4. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The unity of the church, which is the body of Christ, is based on this understanding. Now, when an individual part of the human body fails, or ceases to work properly, then there's a problem, usually manifesting itself in the form of a disease or an illness or an injury. When an individual part of the church body fails or ceases to work properly, then you have a diseased church. Just as there were many diseases of the human body, there are many diseases of the body of Christ. I see Ephesians 4 kind of being broken up into two main sections. And in the first main section, verses 11 through 24, Paul describes how the individual parts of the church are supposed to function, but at the same time indicating areas where there could be a breakdown of the body, and therefore a spiritual disease that needs treatment. Uh, some of those diseases are very similar to diseases of the human body, and if something isn't done about those diseases, then the body will die. So if you just permit me a little bit of our artistic license today, I'd like to make some comparisons between human diseases and spiritual diseases. For example, there could be a disease called elephantiasis. Now, elephantiasis in the human body is a disease where a part of the body will become enormously enlarged and, and out of proportion to the rest of the body. Um, Perhaps you've seen the movie Elephant Man, which talks about a man afflicted with this disease. A truly sad and tragic thing. It's caused by an obstruction of the lymphatic system that just causes the accumulation of fluid that goes to a certain part of the body. Well, in the body of Christ, a similar spiritual condition can arise when one member or several members become too large in proportion to the rest of the body. A person or persons can feel that everything depends on them and that they have to do everything or nothing else will get accomplished. You know, sometimes it uh, is something that's only in their imaginations or there could be something to it where they really do just about everything in the church to where they actually inhibit the contribution and the participation from others. 
And so whether that situation is real or imagined, it still would mean that you have a diseased body. Maybe the pastor that takes on more than he or she should, or another leader in the church who tries to do more than he or she is gifted to do. Verse 11 of Ephesians 4 says, It is he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. So when the individual parts of the body are working properly, then there will not be this elephantiasis, but every part is functioning according to what it has been equipped by God to do. Another disease of the human body is atrophy. Atrophy is a condition that is usually caused by some other physical ailment, where a person is forced to stay in bed or to remain inactive for a long time. And after a while, the muscles have weakened and they have deteriorated to a point where even if the person tried to get up and get about, that he couldn't do it because he's just too weak. He, he, he's become conditioned with, with atrophy. Well, many churches suffer from spiritual atrophy because there just isn't enough spiritual activity to keep the body built up. Now, summertime can be a common time for this to happen when a lot of the usual activities kind of close up and, and then by the time the fall program comes back around, the body is too weak to, to meet the task and, and sometimes have to take time to build back up before anything can truly be accomplished. I think COVID did this to a lot of churches where they just shut down for a while and people got used to not being in a church and not doing things and it took a while for them to, to get built back up again because they were afflicted with atrophy. Or there could be plenty of activity. The church could be very busy, but yet not doing anything of real spiritual consequence to build up Christ's body. Now, things like social activities and, and potlucks and recreation are great things for a church to do and a way to involve people and, and just to, to be active in the church. But if that's all you're doing, then that is going to leave the church in a condition of atrophy in the same way that a person may be very busy eating Twinkies and watching TV, but uh, not building up any muscles. Verse 12 of Ephesians 4 says that we are to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So to build up the body of Christ, our work of service must be continued. Sure, we, we cut back in the summertime to afford families the opportunity to get away and go on vacation. There's nothing wrong with that. After the, the rush and the busyness of Christmas, we take some time off just to do family things and so forth. But just because we don't have a wana or ladies Bible study or choir for a little while doesn't mean that we're just taking a spiritual break. We might be taking a break from some activities. There cannot be inactivity or the body will weaken and deteriorate. So maybe the kind of activities will vary or maybe we'll take a, a break from one kind of spiritual activity for a while so that we can be replenished and invigorated to get back to it when it's time. But we must always continue with our spiritual life. Don't take a break from that. Be sure that you continue studying your Bible. You continue developing your prayer life. You continue in fellowship with other believers before spiritual atrophy sets in. Another thing that can happen to the human body is fractures. That's not necessarily a disease, but still is something that greatly affects the health of a human body. When a bone in the body is broken and it is severed or split from the rest of the body. You know, sometimes there are multiple fractures or compound fractures where more than one bone is broken or is broken in more than one place. And so in order for there to be healing, the bone must be reconnected with the rest of the body or the rest of that bone. And if that isn't done properly, then the healing will not be complete and there will still be pain. Sometimes a doctor will actually have to re-break a bone so that it will heal properly. Well, fractures often happen within the body of Christ when one or more members break or fall away from the others in the body. Feelings get hurt, disagreements arise, policies differ, and the unity of the church can be quickly disrupted. And sometimes it seems like the only option for members is to break away from the rest of the body. But Paul seems to be saying in verse 13 that unity in a church has a lot to do with maturity and knowledge. It says, until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Most fractures in the church are really unnecessary and they could be avoided when there is that proper knowledge of the Word of God and the Son of God. 
and when there is spiritual maturity enough to handle the hurt feelings or the disagreements. If knowledge and maturity are things that are lacking in a church, then there will sure to be fractures that happen in that church, and fractures are painful. Yes, there are times when fractures might be necessary and may actually be the best thing for the overall health of the church, but overall, most of the fractures that happen in a church are very avoidable and very unnecessary. One disease that is very dreaded, and I know a lot of you can relate to, is arthritis. Arthritis usually affects the elderly, but not always. Younger people can get arthritis too. Arthritis is a condition of painful abrasiveness that uh, is caused when bone grinds against bone. As the bones around the joints wear out, the cartilage pulls back and it leaves the bones exposed to, to grind against each other. And it hurts very much when that happens. The cartilage is there to serve as a seat of gristle to prevent this from happening. But when there's no cartilage, when there's no gristle, there's nothing but abrasiveness. And arthritis can be a simply torturous disease. Well, in the body of Christ, sometimes there is spiritual arthritis. The way that people sometimes treat each other in the body of Christ is much like bone grinding against bone. Some people's personalities just seem to clash with each other. And there can be an abrasiveness that can be very damaging to the body of Christ. People take offense at what somebody else said. People get jealous of attention that somebody else is getting. People get mad when somebody else always seems to insist on getting their way. And these situations only get worse unless something is there to serve as that, that gristle to keep contrasting personalities from grinding against each other. And Paul talks about that gristle in verses 15 and 16 as we read those again. It says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Love is the buffer, the cartilage or the gristle, if you will, for that abras abrasiveness that can easily happen in any church. Love can prevent a lot of problems from occurring because, as Paul said to the Corinthians, that love is slow to take offense. Love is patient. Love is not jealous. Love does not seek its own way. Love is not provoked. Love can overpower that basic abrasiveness that naturally happens whenever people work together. All right, then another one. The last word any of us want to hear from our doctor when talking about the health of our physical body is that terrible word, cancer. Cancer is a malignant mass of tissue that invades body parts and, and continues to just expand and to grow and to destroy unless it's totally removed. If it isn't removed, there is no cure for cancer. There are certainly ways to slow it down and to delay the process, but cancer kills the body, sometimes slowly, sometimes very quickly. Well, the cancer of sin can easily invade the spiritual body of Christ. The church, by definition, is made up of people who have been forgiven of sin because they have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. But yet they still sin from time to time from those, when those patterns of their, their former nature takes over. We all do. But when sin becomes in a church something that is just accepted, something that is just shrugged off, when the members of the church become so callous to the things that God strictly forbids, then that callousness is like a cancerous tumor that invades the body and it spreads throughout the body and sucks the life right out of a church. That callousness to sin must be removed or the body of Christ will die. Paul warns of, warns of this in verses 17 through 19. He says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. That kind of cancer should be dreaded by the church just as we would dread having cancer in our physical bodies. It has no place in the church, as Paul says in verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way, 
Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. And one more dreaded disease that is greatly feared is that of gangrene. Gangrene is when a certain part of the body has become infected to the point where the nutrition to that body part is interfered with. I had to search a long time to find a, an image of gangrene that was not too gross to show because uh, it is really ugly to look at. But if the infection is, is bad enough, then the body part becomes useless and might even have to be amputated so that the infection doesn't spread and the rest of the body can be saved. Well, when a member of the body of Christ reverts back to that former way of life, life without Christ, when he cuts off his source of spiritual nutrition, then he becomes corrupted. And if that nutrition in God's word is not restored, then that corruption is a lot like gangrene and makes that member useless for God's service. And for the good of the whole church body might even have to be amputated, separated from the rest of the body. Verse 22 in our, our chapter for today says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul does a pretty good job of, of describing how the body of Christ should function and how to avoid these various spiritual diseases that can creep into the church so easily. But what about the church that's already diseased? Is there really any hope once these problems have sprouted and flourished? Well, to me, the rest of Ephesians 4 addresses this. Paul not only gives us his diagnosis and his prognosis for the church, but he also talks about the cure for these spiritual diseases in verses 25 to 32. Paul seems to readdress each of these issues in this last section of this chapter. For example, in verse 25, he talks about members of one another in terms of being honest with each other. Verse 25 says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Once a church has been stricken with that spiritual elephantitis, where uh, some members are abnormally prominent, there needs to be an honest evaluation of what it means to be members of one another, an honest evaluation of the gifts that God has distributed among that body. Each member must ask himself is he, if he's making somebody else do the job that, that he should be performing in the body, or if he is trying to function in a way that he is not equipped spiritually to do. And that takes brutal honesty with yourself and with others. And it's hard, but it's really the only way that that disease can be cured. And so the cure for spiritual elephantiasis is honesty. The cure for spiritual atrophy, which is weakness from inactivity, is found in verse 28. It says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. See, calling yourself a member of a church and, and a part of the body of Christ, and yet failing to be active in its work, and its ministry is sort of like stealing. It's claiming for yourself what you don't own. And Paul says such a person should stop stealing. Instead, he should pitch in and work with what he has been given to be useful to do and to do his share. And I don't think anyone has found a way for a person with weak muscles to become strong without plain hard work. A church that is atrophic, that is suffering from atrophy, that, that is weak from inactivity, cannot become strong unless everyone works at it and, and stops stealing from the rest of the body. And for those who think that they just aren't able to do anything, you're probably wrong about that. But if all you can do is pray for one another, then you are doing a tremendous thing to build up the body of Christ. What a difference your prayers can make if you'll be faithful in doing that. The cure for fractures in the body of Christ is found in verse 29. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I don't know if I can even emphasize this one strong enough. I don't think I have to try because God's Word says it pretty plainly. Most of the time, people break off from the church because they were hurt or offended by something somebody said most likely the pastor. <laughs> if members of God's body, the church, will guard their speech, speaking only what is wholesome, what is for building others up and addressing their needs, 
then many of the fractures that exist in churches can be healed. In the case of spiritual arthritis, that abrasiveness that often exists among church members, Paul says in verse 26, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, conflict and disagreement in a church is as common as anything can be. It happens all the time in every church. A church would not be normal without it. But conflict must be dealt with. It doesn't just go away as much as we'd like it to. But it can be dealt with in a Christ-like way, at the proper venues, through the proper channels. Being angry is a natural thing. It's a human thing and can easily happen even in church work. But a church needs to learn to use anger to bring resolutions to problems and not to let that anger fester and the problems get worse. Each day passes and the sun goes down on that anger and the devil is given a foothold and, and more problems are created because of the anger rather than what the original problems were in the first place. Conflicts must be handled but in a Christ-like way. It's like having a cartilage operation for arthritis. The cure for the cancer of sin is found in verse 32. Classic verse here. It says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The cancer of sin goes into permanent remission when we fully realize what God in Christ has done for us. That hard tumor of callousness is dissolved and removed as Jesus changes us from within and he gives us a tender, kind, and forgiving heart. That cancer of, of callousness can be melted away only through that process of repentance and forgiveness that can be experienced in a living relationship with God. Then there's the gangrene, that, that spiritual infection of the old nature which can spread into a corruption of the entire body because that nutrition has been cut off. Verse 31 names those things that interfere with that spiritual nutrition that we need. And these are things that must be gotten rid of if the disease is going to be cured. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. These things have no place within the body of Christ, not, not in a healthy body. And unless they're removed, then they will set in like gangrene and infect the, the entire body. Now, diseases of the human body can happen to anybody. Many of them could be avoided with proper health care in the first place, but still when they do happen, most of them can be dealt with when you have the proper treatment. Same way in the church. Diseases can crop up at any time, anywhere. And although they could be avoided, but if there is a diseased church, it doesn't have to stay that way. Maybe our church has one or more of these diseases I've mentioned. It was not my intent to, to indicate that, that it does, in case you're looking around and wondering, who is he talking about? That's not at all what this is about one bit. But if it ever does become the case, let's get rid of those diseases. Let's have Ephesians 4 hidden in our hearts and come alive in our lifestyle as a church. And it starts with individuals turning their lives over to Jesus. If there's anyone here today who would like to take that all-important step, we invite you to do so, to become a part of the body of Christ, a body that gets complicated, a body that, that is multifunctioning and has a lot of things that can go wrong, but yet is a beautiful component of what living in Jesus is all about, to be a part of his family, a part of his church, a part of his body. If you'd like to become a part of that today, would you come forward as we sing a closing hymn about the body of Christ?